Welcome to episode two of Let's Rage Together, a podcast where two friends talk about total liberation and related topics. We annihilated the world before your very ears. You can't handle the Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for the second episode of Let's Rage Together. I'm Taryn. And I'm Pete. And today we're talking about the abolitionist approach to animal rights and the issues with single issue campaigns within the vegan movement. Before we get started, we just wanted to say thanks so much to everyone for all of the support. We've got amazing feedback from people. Um, So thanks to all of you, but especially thanks to the people who took time to give us constructive feedback, namely Aiden, Rich, Megan, Rachel, Robin, Earth AD, Tim, Thiessen, Christian, and Brett. And, and another thank you to Brett for actually being the person who encouraged us to start this podcast. Yeah, every bit of radness you hear is thanks to Brett. <laughs> if you still want to send us any dog pictures or give us feedback or comments on the last episode or today's episode, you can email us on let's rage together podcast at gmail.com. Also, our new website is up at let's rage together.ca.ca. And you can find us now on Facebook and Instagram with the handle at Let's Rage Together Podcast. Also, besides for listening to the podcast on iTunes or on our website, you'll soon be able to find us on a bunch of different podcast platforms, which we all announce via our social media networks. So keep an eye on them. Yeah. And before we get started with the main content of the episode, we're going to do another session of the bad and the rad. So this uh, segment is basically... Each of us saying two things that we think are bad and two things that we think are rad. Uh, Sometimes it'll just be a random fact about us, not too serious. Sometimes it'll be something kind of news relevant, um, something a bit more serious. But it's just kind of a fun way to talk about some topics that maybe don't warrant an entire episode or just a way for you to get to know us a bit better. If you think something we say warrants an entire episode, then let us know. Yeah. Or if you just want to comment on it, if you agree, or you also hate things that we hate, then we'd love to hear that as well. So Pete, what is your first bad? My first bad is sinks, Taryn. What do you mean sinks? So I don't know if you've noticed, but I noticed this, that the taps in sinks are too close to the back wall of the sink. Like you can't wash your hands without touching the sink wall. (laughs) And that is so irritating. I've literally never washed my hand and like had my hand touch the back of the sink ever How maybe you, you just have like that? gargantuan hands really, it really bothers me it's a problem in the world i wish that people would change sinks that taps came further out into the sink there's still enough space around it to move your hands around if you need to put on soap or whatever but sinks serve multiple purposes so like if you're doing something like Maybe you need to put a bucket in there to get water or something. You can't do that if it's super long. But if it's right against the wall, you have to lean the bucket. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Just make taps bigger and longer <laughs> and stop it. That really annoys me. Start a petition, anyway, Pete. Anyway, this is, that's my first bad. What's okay. your first bad, Taryn? Um, my first bad is just hearing people chew or any other gross face sounds, especially when food is involved. <laughs> like, I cannot handle it. Like, if I have to listen to people chew, it makes me question how much I value not being violent. <laughs> I know when, it sounds terrible and petty, but I just can't. When, when last did this happen to you? <laughs> like, all the time. If I can hear anyone chewing, like I'd rather listen to music or something while eating. Because if I hear someone chew, even myself, it like freaks me out. <laughs> even yourself, even if you hear Well, your it doesn't own irritate me when I hear myself, but I like get self-conscious because I know how much I get irritated when I hear other people chew. And sneezing? No, that's fine. Okay. It's petty, I know, but it's a real issue in my life. What is your second bad? My second bad is celebrity worship or culture or whatever you want to call it. But I feel like... Um, It's not just prevalent in mainstream society. Even within veganism or any movement that is supposed to be focused on a cause, you get the celebrity worship and culture. And I feel like it can very easily distract from what we are trying to do as a movement, whichever movement you're part of. 
So I find it often very problematic that someone will latch onto some activist who is problematic, but because they think of them as like this hero for animals or hero in whatever movement you are a part of, it distracts from it because they can do anything. And because you think of them as this god-like celebrity, uh, it just doesn't help things. And it just annoys me. Yeah, it's super problematic, especially like you say, when there's someone who's doing some good in some way on some platform, it kind of gives people this get out of anything else free card. Yeah, It's like, I'm a great animal rights activist and so I can be like a misogynist or whatever, especially in like Hollywood celebrity vibes. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, this happens in music all the time, uh, you know, like a singer of a band does something. But everyone loves that band. So they'll just turn a blind eye. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, what he did to that girl was like horrendous, but I'm sure it's fine. He must be a nice guy because he's in that band that I like. Yeah. And they sing about feminism or something. Yeah. Well, they don't, but we'll just pretend that they're still nice guys. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. But let's get off that heavy point and onto your second bad. So another thing that kind of irritates me, well, it does irritate me, is people completely slating organizations like SPCA um, for euthanizing animals. And I mean, you know, I'm super for animal rights and I don't think that, um, you know, killing any animal that's healthy is ever okay. It's immoral and it's wrong. But organizations like the SPCA have to do it because people are breeding animals and they are there's like massive overpopulation and Everyone is all about these no-kill shelters, which is great in theory, but what they don't realize is a lot of the time there are dogs sitting there for years, like getting cage madness and getting depressed and all of these things. And what people also don't realize is no-kill shelters just when they're full, they're full. Mm. So those animals then have to go to somewhere like SPCA and then people just accuse them of being animal murderers. But I'm like, okay, if you run a branch with like a hundred kennels and you get 400 strays that month, where are you going to put them? Yeah. Like, what are you going to do? And I find the people who complain about it the most are the ones who have never volunteered for a day in their lives. And I mean, I've worked pretty closely with SPCAs. I've counseled some of the staff and none of them want to do that, you know, and they just get like dragged over the coals for essentially cleaning up other people's mess. Yeah. I think a lot of people forget that no-kill shelters, like any shelter, have limited resources. You can only take so many animals. And like you say, when they're full, they're full. And I mean, I've spoken to people about this before and their solutions just don't seem very um, practical often. Like, for example, I heard someone say, well, why don't we just release them all? (laughs) That's ridiculous. Like, like, that's an ecological disaster. Exactly. So environmentally, that would be extremely irresponsible. Well, the worst is the people who say, well, you mustn't, you mustn't put them to sleep. You must find them homes. But they are the same people who won't step foot into a shelter because it's too sad. <laughs> and I'm like, of course, it's fucking sad because we have to kill animals because you won't set foot in there to adopt them. Yeah. So, yeah, that's super irritating. But also on that note, if you're listening to this and you have space for a companion animal, please adopt and <laughs> don't Please. don't go to a puppy mill or a breeder or, or a pet whatever. Shop. Just Please. adopt an animal and stop complaining. <laughs> Please adopt, don't shop. Yes. And if you're going to criticize those organizations, that's fine. But then show me where you've tried to open a shelter. Show me the 400 cages you're going to build every month <laughs> to house those animals or the 400 homes to send them to. Anyway, rant over. Good point to you. What's your first rad? Okay, my first rad is that I'm really stoked that Spotify is now available in South Africa. Being able to get all this music, it costs the same amount as Apple Music or Google Music or whatever. And I'm just really loving it. So I was listening to it at work the other day, really trying to concentrate. Um, the, this is the free account. And I was playing like Mogwai or some concentration music or something. And then all of a sudden I hear this like, cracking beer can and a crowd <laughs> roaring and i realized i just have to purchase the premium account it's terrible and uh yeah so anyway i'm not getting paid for this i'm just like 
happy that's part of our is here now. So. Yeah, I need to actually still sign up, but it's very rad. You should. What's your first rad? So mine is just how rad it is that people from generally pretty underground niche kind of communities, so like the hardcore scene, for example, or veganism, where it's not a kind of mainstream community, and just how it brings random people from all walks of life together. I've met some of my best friends through hardcore music and through veganism, or both, like you, Pete. <laughs> Um, uh-huh. And it's just rad because a lot of the people that um, I consider friends now, I would never have probably crossed paths with ever yeah. because we're just so different. But yeah, it's just cool how those communities just bring like-minded people together. I agree. That's awesome. I've yeah. also made most of my best friends through music and underground stuff yeah. that I've been into. Also, who wants to be part of the mainstream, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your second rad? So my second rad is a account that I came across on Instagram. They have a bunch of social networks, but they're called White Nonsense Roundup. And I really like the idea of this. It ties into the idea and um, like recent conversation around being an ally and what mm-hmm. that means. So White Nonsense Roundup, if I read the about on their website, was created by white people for white people to address our inherently racist society. We believe it is our responsibility to call out white friends, relatives, contacts, speakers, and authors who are contributing to structural racism and harming our friends of color. We are a resource for anti-racist images, links, videos, artworks, essays, and voices. These can be used by anyone for a DIY White Nonsense Roundup or by the White Nonsense Roundup team to support people of color upon their request. So basically, what they're doing is taking on the emotional burden that people of color shouldn't have to take on educating white people about racism. Yeah. And I'm not talking about the blatant or simple racism that you hear, but structural and institutionalized racism. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a great way to be an ally. Yeah, that's awesome. Because it shouldn't be on people of color to tell us why what we're saying is wrong about people of color. Exactly. So you should check them out. And give them a like and a follow. Definitely. So what's your second rad? Mine is not a very new story or a new... I mean, a lot of people have probably heard about this. But I just wanted to mention it because it's just so rad on so many levels. So the International Anti-Poaching Foundation, or IAPF, basically started a project in Zimbabwe called Akashinga, which means the brave ones. And it empowers previously disadvantaged African women, which includes single moms, wives of poachers in prison, victims of abuse and domestic violence, and orphans, and employs them to protect wilderness areas instead of relying on trophy hunting as a means of income. So these women are getting empowered and trained properly with like defense tactics and stuff like that to do conservation and anti-poaching essentially. Um, And 70% of the operational cost goes back into the community in the form of employment and supplies that they need and things like that. And the project is vegan. Wow. And yeah, it's just really badass because it's it's tackling so many issues. I mean, it's a vegan uh, project. It's empowering previously disadvantaged women, then empowering their families through their income. Um, Obviously, it's feminist because it's empowering women. So it's just like so rad yeah, on so many levels. That's amazing. Also environmentally, yes, like yeah. conservation-wise, it has like so many levels of just rad. Yeah, stuff. it's not just like just conservation. It's all of these things at once. And I think it ties in pretty well to what we're speaking about today in relation to single issues. Like this is such a good project in terms of being an example for how to tackle so many different issues at once. Yeah, one single project is just tackling one community's problems on a whole range of levels. So I thought that was rad. Sounds amazing. What's awesome is that that ties in so well to the idea of total liberation as well, like recognizing multiple oppressions Mm. and forms of uh, domination. So um, to get onto the topic of the episode again, uh, that was a great entryway into it thanks to you. <laughs> i'm um, quite slick like that so so 
you know that our podcast is obviously about total liberation and total liberation is about animal earth and human liberation and it is against all forms of oppression and domination basically the idea that none can be free until all are free so veganism and and non-human animal liberation are just one element of total liberation and that could be argued as a single issue in itself Um, but we'll discuss that in the context of total liberation and define total liberation more for you in another episode so we we don't believe that total liberation will ever be achieved without veganism and animal liberation which is why we decided to do this episode yeah so today we are focusing on single issue activism within the vegan movement So we're not talking about sort of veganism as one aspect of total liberation, but we're focusing on vegan activism specifically because we are both pretty involved with that sort of activism. And this topic is raised pretty frequently when kind of discussing vegan activism and vegan campaigns and animal rights campaigns. So when we're talking about um, the issues with single issues, a lot of what we're going to discuss today does apply to other issues of social justice. But I think it's pretty well recognized in other areas, um, especially relating to human justice issues, that even when in those sort of fields you're focusing on one area specifically, there's always this kind of understanding that there is a bigger context and that even if, for example, you're fighting for women's rights to vote, it's not just because that's the end goal, it's because it's kind of obvious that it's because women deserve equal rights as a whole whereas in veganism it's not as clear-cut um so a lot of single issues within veganism are often just seen in isolation yeah so so in this episode we're discussing the abolitionist approach to animal rights and liberation versus the versus single issue advocacy basically and we'll also discuss welfareism and reducitarianism approaches to advocating for animals For those of you who aren't super familiar with animal rights and welfareism and all the different kind of terms that we're going to be discussing, welfareism is essentially organizations and movements and campaigns that seek to reduce harm to animals. So they don't address the issue of using animals, but it's more about making conditions better, living conditions, slaughter conditions, those sort of things. It's all about improving overall welfare of the animal without addressing the use. And it's and basically saying that animals still belong to us and we yeah. can use them. Yeah, exactly. And then reducitarianism is basically promoting a reduction in use or consumption of animal products with a sort of overarching pragmatic view that the more people who reduce use, the better it is for animals, sort of as a utilitarian approach, um, I guess, you know the most amount of positive for the most amount of individuals, which also obviously doesn't question the idea of using animals. It just says use them less. Mm. Things like meat-free Monday or, you know, cut down on your meat consumption, those sort of things are all reducitarian. And then the rights or liberation approach to animal rights focuses on the legal and or moral rights of animals to essentially live their own lives without being used and exploited by humans. So that is obviously the approach that we adopt as vegans. Uh, We believe in animal rights, we believe in animal liberation, and we consider ourselves for the most part abolitionist. So although we don't agree with everything Francione says, we mostly consider ourselves abolitionist. And then just a last term that we need to define Um, which we'll probably use throughout, uh, is speciesism, which is quite simply discrimination based on species membership. Cool. So the the abolitionist approach basically means that we are against all use and exploitation of animals. If you want to find out more about this, you can go to abolitionistapproach.org. So we will put a link to that in the show notes. So basically there's six principles Uh, in abolitionist veganism and we've decided to structure the episode around it because we think they highlight pretty clearly the issues that there are with single issues and their related approaches to it. So since we're talking about the abolitionist approach to animal rights in contrast to single issue campaigns specifically, single issue campaigns are essentially just campaigns that focus on a single issue within veganism such as the use of fur or meat or leather or circuses or zoos so focusing on one 
type of exploitation as opposed to all use? The first principle is um, abolitionists maintain that all sentient beings, human or non-human, have one right, the basic right not to be treated as the property of others. Yeah. So single issue campaigns in general, basically one changes in how animals are used and those would be more your welfareist campaigns. So they would lobby against gestation crates for pregnant sows, for example. Um, That's just one issue within the animal agriculture industry. Whereas we want no use, not better use. So it's either single issues either are about welfare reform or they can be about abolition, but of one type of exploitation, like I mentioned. So for or circuses or ending factory farming. So it's funny that you mentioned circuses because it makes me think of the famous air quotes victory of getting the ringling bros to phase out using elephants, which was supposed to be by this year. Mm. And it just seems like ridiculous to me that the that people were fighting so hard for this and so excited about this so-called victory. Because what kind of victory is it really? Like, what does it say about the other animals they're using in their circus, in their acts? Doesn't it just reinforce the hierarchy of intelligence as a basis for moral rights? If that's the reason why people want them to stop using elephants because they're so intelligent and their capacity for suffering is greater. Like, what does that say about the other animals they're using? You know? Yeah. When, when that whole story came out, I actually... I didn't even read any of the articles. I just saw headlines and I just saw a bunch of people freaking out about how happy they were. And I had assumed that they had banned all animal use in their circus. And I was like, okay, that's rad. But then when I heard that it was just elephants, I don't understand why so many vegans were stoked about that. Cool for those elephants. But like you say, they'll just be replaced by so-called lesser animals. And in actual fact, those elephants are still owned by the circus. Really? So I saw a blog post, I can't remember exactly where, but speaking about how those elephants are essentially being sent back to what they call a sanctuary, but it's where they were trained. So it's essentially the root of their trauma in becoming performing animals. They're being sent back there and are even being rented out to zoos for breeding Jeez. and things like that. I mean, there is no, there is no um, kind or nice way to train elephants. Exactly. You have, to, you have to break their spirit yeah. in order to train them. And at the end of the day, the only reason that that is being allowed is because they are still seen as property. So yes. it's not a victory. It's not a victory for veganism. It's not a victory for animals. It's not even a victory for the elephants. So people are freaking out and so happy about it. And it's actually doing nothing. That sucks. So, yeah. So we definitely agree with that first principle that animals should just not be seen as property ever. Because they're not. They're yeah. living sentient beings human or or non-human yeah absolutely principle two of the abolitionist approach is in summary abolitionists maintain that our recognition of this one basic right means that we must abolish and not merely regulate institutionalized animal exploitation and that abolitionists should not support welfare reform campaigns or single issue campaigns and this point is pretty much the core of this episode yeah. That we do not support single issue campaigns or welfare reform campaigns. So to to use the a quote from Gary L. Francia, and he came up with the abolitionist approach. I mean, I wouldn't call myself a devout Gary Francia and follower, but he does make some good points. So he said, anti fur, anti vivisection, and anti hunting campaigns have been around forever and have not only not worked, but the uses of these things have actually increased. More animals are being exploited now in more horrific ways than at any other time in human history. We need to convince people that if animals matter morally, and most people think that they do, we can't eat, use, or consume animal products. Until we convince greater numbers of people to go vegan, nothing will change. Yeah, exactly. And in, I think both of us can agree that single issues are never okay. And um, this might seem a bit inconsistent for those of you who follow us on Instagram would have seen that we went to an anti-vivisection protest recently, which of course is single issue. But our views on this um, will kind of unpack as we go, but it's not as straightforward as just not supporting them at all. But another Francia and blog post actually, which we'll also link in the show notes, explains things pretty well just in terms of why single issue in animal rights doesn't work and he was asked a question by someone saying well let's say for example 
if we had to go and help people in Haiti with uh, when there were natural disasters and you know it was very urgent if we help there doesn't it mean that we don't care about other things that are happening in other parts of the world with humans does not mean that that's essentially a single issue for humans should we just not help them and Francione explains quite nicely that it is different for humans because we know for example that human suffering is bad in any context whether it's from a flood or a hurricane or you know terrorism or whatever it might be those are all seen as morally undesirable human suffering is morally undesirable so if x y and z are all morally undesirable working on one of those doesn't mean that we don't care about the others so if there are children that are hungry in three different continents and we help one it doesn't mean we don't care about the others because everybody knows that it's bad in all those situations mm. but on the other hand in terms of veganism and animal rights it's seen as desirable and normal to use and exploit animals so the majority of people eat animal flesh the majority of people exploit animals in some way uh, without questioning it so it's seen as a, a societal norm or social norm so in this instance x y and z are so all seen as morally desirable they're all normal so when we focus on only one we are only challenging that assumption in one so we're essentially saying yes Y and Z are morally desirable. We're focusing on X because X is wrong. So when we focus on fur, for example, what we're actually saying when we stop someone in the street and say, why are you wearing fur? Fur is disgusting. Do you know what happens to animals in the fur industry? And we're ignoring the fact that they're wearing leather boots. That is saying that I'm totally okay with the fact that you have animal flesh on your feet, but I'm going to attack you for this fur. Yeah, it's totally inconsistent. It, it makes no sense whatsoever. Like why, why scream at someone for wearing a fur coat? when someone yeah. else is wearing a leather jacket. And you the let them walk thing. past. It's, yeah. it's all animal exploitation. Yeah. So he does also say in the blog post that if you do support single issue campaigns, and we'll get into the details of why and when we think it is okay to support these campaigns, um, if you do support them, it's important to make sure that there's a very clear and explicit vegan message or animal rights message within that, showing people that all exploitation is wrong even if you're currently focusing on one thing. So there has to be a baseline yeah. of an animal liberation message, even if you're doing a single issue thing. Yeah. An organization that often comes up and criticized for being single issue are Sea Shepherd. And I personally support Sea Shepherd and have friends involved with Sea Shepherd. And I personally don't believe that Sea Shepherd should be thought of as single issue mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. The first is that they promote veganism and animal liberation. If someone had to argue that Sea Shepherd are a single issue because they focus on marine life, by the same logic, you would be able to criticize any other organization who focuses on, for example, farm animals mm. or on wildlife or whatever. Because just in terms of sheer numbers, there are more ocean animals murdered each year than land animals. Yeah. So it's species, it would be speciesist to say that organization focusing on farmed animals is not single issue, but Sea Shepherd is. Yeah, definitely. Um, I feel like often organizations and activists forget about um, fish and marine life as well. So that's, they are an issue. Well, they are some of the most exploited animals and yet most people don't even mention them in activism or totally. a lot of people anyway, yeah. just because we don't live in the sea. Yeah. So um, even in terms of what they do within the marine life like sector, they don't only focus on whales, but also fight for other animals like dolphins, tuna, turtles, vaquita porpoises, etc. But what's really important is that the underlying message is still veganism and animal liberation. Yeah. Um, I also feel like no one else is really doing anything for mm -hmm. marine animals. Sea Shepherd have a couple of boats in the sea that are doing stuff, but I feel like not many people are doing direct action-based activism in the oceans. Mm, definitely. Um, like... Greenpeace are the only other organization that I know of that are trying to do stuff, but they don't seem to be doing that much, to be honest. And they've only just started to recognize that animal agriculture and consumption is an issue. The, the final point that I have is that they also do, they're doing direct action and literally putting their lives at risk in defense of animals. And that can't be taken too lightly. So that's just one organization that I think people often see as single issue 
that I would argue aren't because of the stance that they have. Yeah, that's the thing. And it could they could still be seen as single issue if they weren't promoting veganism, because then they would be, even if they were the only ones fighting for marine life, um, it's still single issue. Same as any organizations that completely ignore marine life are single issue. Yeah. But I kind of look at single issues, I call it the theory and practice of single issues. So on the one hand, theoretically, I'm completely opposed to single issues, because in theory, we should be focusing on veganism um, as a whole, as an, on animal liberation as a whole. And we should always be conveying that message no matter what we're doing. From a practical perspective, though, I think that sometimes single issues are not only okay, but they're necessary. And what I mean by that is that practically we cannot do everything. We can always do vegan education, sure. But things like the work that Sea Shepherd is doing or physically rescuing farm animals, those things require resources and time and focus and a lot of the time specialized expertise and knowledge. So you can't be an expert in everything. You can't go and necessarily work on a sea shepherd boat for three months and then also have a sanctuary for farm animals. Like we just can't all do everything. So from a practical perspective, I think we, we definitely have space for single issue activism in terms of just what we are practically doing. But from a theoretical perspective and the messaging that goes along with what we're doing, that needs to always be vegan. Yeah, so it's a, it's. I think it ties into when you think about often in any movement, the most effective thing is a diversity of tactics. Yeah. So even so, theoretically, you need to be on the same page. Yeah. But practically, have a diversity of tactics. Yeah, that's exactly it. So your tactics can be single issue, but your messaging must always be abolitionist. That's cool. And um, that's kind of what our approach was going to the anti-vivisection march is that we had vegan messaging on our placards or whatever you call them yeah but we weren't there just to say vivisection is wrong we were there to say we support the ban on vivisection because animal use is wrong as a whole yeah and that's like cruelty is not wrong use of animals is, is wrong yeah exactly which obviously encompasses um, cruelty as well i also think in terms of the individual it's it's possible to do more than one thing yeah so an activist on a sea shepherd ship could also be doing Anonymous for the Voiceless or uh, working with refugees or mm. whatever. Like as one person who's working with one organization, it doesn't mean that you are single issue or supporting single issue because you have the capacity to do more than one thing. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of activists do. They're involved with a number of different organizations and rights groups. And sometimes that will involve practical single issue tactics. But I think as long as the messaging is clear, then that's fine. Cool. So um, the third principle of the, of the abolitionist approach is that abolitionists maintain that veganism is a moral baseline and that creative, nonviolent vegan education must be the cornerstone of rational animal rights advocacy. Yeah, and this is essentially what we were saying, um, at least in relation to the first point there, that veganism must be the moral baseline. So... Things like vegetarianism, reducitarianism, welfareism, all of those less than vegan things or are not going to cut it. They're not helping animals in the same way that saying a circus is not going to use elephants anymore doesn't do anything for animals. Mm. So the baseline has to be all use is wrong because it's all exploitative. Yeah. So it's, it, that also is like you mentioned Meat Free Mondays. Mm. If we promote Meat Free Mondays, what we are really doing is reinforcing the idea that it's okay for people to eat animal flesh the other six days of the week. Mm. Uh, or like if you pushed for more humane slaughter methods, mm. you are still reinforcing the idea that animals are commodities. And that as long as we do it the right way, it's okay. And there's no right way to do the wrong thing. Exactly. And with things like Meat Free Mondays, it's not even um, you know, saying that it's okay to eat animal flesh on the other days it's actually making people feel good about it because it's almost like they've done their good deed for the week so now they can eat dead animals with a totally clear conscience the rest of the week and that just almost ingrains even deeper in them the sense that they have the right to objectify and use and exploit animals yeah totally i feel like also um animal activists often concentrate on our consumer choices and mm -hmm. make that kind of like the basis of their, their like education. 
Yeah. But I would argue that consumerism and our buying power has like a relatively small part to play in mm. this in this fight for animal liberation and eventually total liberation. But the, the bigger issue is how we think about animals. Yeah. Not what we are buying or not buying. And I also think that it's almost um it's like privileged advocacy to just focus on consumers' choices because you're saying, Oh, but look at this vegan cheese you have access to. Look how easy it is. So you're basically reinforcing how easy it is, which firstly is a cop out, like think about your values first yeah. before like convenience. And secondly, it's reinforcing social privilege because and financial privilege because if there are people who want to go vegan but can't afford the fancy cheeses and the whatever then what are we doing in in our activism if we're just focusing on products what do you do with the people who can't afford all those fancy products exactly can i just say as well though that i hate when people talk about journeys and baby steps (laughs) like my vegan journey it's okay baby steps like Animals are dying right now. Like, there's no baby steps for that. Yeah. Man, if you, I don't know. Try, try and get the cow being led currently to get her throat slit and tell them, I'll get to you just now. Yeah, baby I'm steps. I'm just on a journey and taking yeah, baby steps. Yeah, this is my personal journey. I know you're about to die. Yeah. But like, for me personally, it's just a little bit inconvenient now. So you're going to have to yeah. just die. My checkers currently doesn't have this cheese. And baby steps as well. Like, you would never say to someone who's, like, sexist, you know what, Pete, you're super sexist, but just take baby steps. You know, be a little bit less sexist today. You'll get there eventually. It's a journey. I believe in you. (laughs) You know, exploiting others is fine. Like, as long as your journey is, like, on the right path. Yeah, or or just exploit women on Mondays. Yeah. Or Or just reduce it by like 50%. (laughs) And then you'll be totally fine in my books. Yeah. No, you would never do that. Yeah, it sounds ridiculous. And look, I do understand that to an extent for most of us, it is some kind of journey, like a mental process you have to go through. I would call it more of like like a a shift. Yeah, a shift or a process that you have to go through like emotionally and psychologically and cognitively and on all of those levels. But, oh man, can we just cut the journey? Like, cut the journey and the baby stems crap out, please. Just go vegan and stop making excuses. And if you don't want to go vegan, then quite frankly, just say you don't care. I think I can hear people clapping in the background. <laughs> or like unfriending me. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think about the point in this principle, though, that's about nonviolent vegan education? I do think that nonviolent vegan education is really important as far as possible and that we should be respectful of other people and of their situations and of the victims themselves when you're talking about what happens to animals and when we're doing advocacy, we don't need to use violent tactics necessarily, especially when we're doing education. But I think there is a place for it. Also, I think Francione talks a lot about being against showing graphic footage which from a psychological perspective I can understand. Uh, We should be respectful of the victims and, you know, what they went through and the fact that what we're showing is very sensitive material, essentially. But on the other hand, if I was the one being murdered or one of the billions being murdered and nothing was being done about it and there were millions of others standing behind me and people were just not listening, I would say to the people actually speaking up for us, I would say, you know what? Show people how I got murdered. If that's what it's going to take to wake them up and stop this from happening, show them. So a lot of people I think have criticized like Anonymous for the Voiceless and organizations like that for showing those images and saying it's disrespectful to the animals and it's traumatic for the people. But quite frankly, it might be traumatic for people, but it's life and death for the animals. Mm. And... Yes, it might be seen to be disrespectful to the lives of the victims, but it's the only way sometimes to get people to realize that it's actually happening. Yeah, and for example, I spoke to an artist that I met the other day, and they spoke about how they are always so frustrated that they create art with this message, and no one really takes it seriously. Mm. And they were saying that they totally understand people showing graphic footage because people just don't seem to get it unless you put it in their face. Like, yeah. this is what's happening. Yeah, and obviously that's not always the case. A lot of the time you can do vegan education and people will listen. 
but sometimes it's really effective to show the truth immediately. Yeah. This is what's happening. It sucks. It's violent, but it's the truth. This is what you're paying for. So that's it. We we do agree. I think that nonviolence is is the best approach. But sometimes it's necessary, although we do disagree with some forms of aggressive advocacy. Yeah. For example, like direct action everywhere. Mm. I don't think that screaming at someone inside of a KFC is going to make them go vegan or no. help anything. You really are just making vegans look dumb. Yeah, you're just feeding into all those stereotypes of veganism. Like nobody wants to be shouted at. Yeah. And if you see any of the footage of that happening, you can mm -hmm. see how unreceptive people are towards it. Yeah. And if you think about it, the majority of these people probably are ignorant about what happens in animal agriculture. And if you haven't even taken the time to have a respectful conversation with them, then why would they listen to you if you're shouting in their face? Yeah. I mean, if, it's different if you're shouting at someone because they know exactly what's happening and they're like trying to shove bacon in your face or something, then I would also get angry and aggressive or at least defensive. Yeah. But just walking up to a stranger and shouting in their face that they're murderers, that, that is just completely... Yeah. It also makes me think about a, a point that Carol J. Adams makes, mm. that doing advocacy when there's animal flesh as food present mm. is just not a good time to do it. Yeah. Because essentially the, the non-vegan's belief system is reinforced by the meat in front of them. Yeah. And the meat in front of them is reinforced by their belief system. And so it's just a really bad time to advocate. Mm. Just a sideline, like if you are doing this, if you're trying to advocate for veganism or animal liberation, animal rights, just rather do it at any time except a meal time when people mm. are actually eating animals. I think that's also why it's difficult to, to convince family and friends a lot of the time because the topic of veganism often comes up while you're eating food and you're eating food while everyone else is eating flesh. Yeah. Um, that's when you'll get questioned about it, but it's better to just kind of sidestep those questions until after. So... Carol J. Adams also brings up how, um, like you said, you'll, you will get questioned about it. Often, uh, if you're vegan, you know, you're not the one that brings it up during the, the meal. And someone will bring it up. And essentially, what they're doing is making you now the form of entertainment. And they are, she gets quite metaphorical and talks about how they are consuming you basically, as entertainment, the same way that they are consuming the animal flesh. So, so there's multiple layers of problems with advocating to people during these times. And like you said, you're not, these, these kind of aggressive forms of advocacy aren't just advocating. It's like aggressively advocating. And I think it's just not helping anything. Mm. And on the, the note of having the animal flesh right in front of them, they also will defend it because they're busy engaging in it. Exactly. So I think that's why it's also easier sometimes for people who kind of start eating plant-based for health reasons and then become ethical vegans later on because it's much easier to question your values and your ethics when you're no longer engaging in that behavior. Like directly so, participating. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Principle four of the abolitionist approach says the abolitionist approach links the moral status of non-humans with sentience alone and not with any other cognitive characteristic. All sentient beings are equal for the purpose of not being used exclusively as a resource. So I think the main thing that we can see is that um, being single issue against one form of exploitation basically implies that other forms of animal exploitation are okay. Um, for example, in the fight against vivisection, it's much easier to get people to stop testing on primates, I think, than on rodents, for mm. example. Because of, like I mentioned, that there's a hierarchy of intelligence sometimes that can mm. define an animal's moral status. And humans tend to like using intelligence as a, as a measure of worth or as a measure of um, suitability for exploitation. The more intelligent the being, the less likely we are to want to exploit them a lot of the time yeah so i try to think about how we create hierarchy when it comes to animals and i, I feel like the animals that get priority in a south african context you get like for example the big five mm. which is like this completely random grouping of animals but they like these big impressive animals i also often wonder just a 
random side points if people think of them as more important because they appear on money. I think it, I don't know, it re- reinforces each other. Aren't they on the money because they're already prioritized? Yeah, I think you, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I haven't really thought this out, but I just thought of this random No, but point. it's a good point because it's like we've decided these big impressive animals are big and impressive so we're going to put them on our money and we know money makes people impressive exactly and then you get the animals that are cute and can show affection that's easily understandable for example dogs and cats Mm. Uh, then you get primates because they are very genetically close to us and it's easy to see and prove how inherently cruel anything done to them is and then it's based on like this trickle down of intelligence and sentience Mm. But I don't know, that's just what I thought of as how we create hierarchy, specifically within a South African context, but I guess it's the same everywhere. I think for everyone, it's basically, it's just this core anthropocentric kind of view that likeness to us has priority, whether it's on the basis of, not necessarily likeness to us, but um, importance to us, whether it's on the basis of likeness or on intelligence because we consider ourselves intelligent or cuteness because we like cute animals it's all based on human-centric or anthropocentric um, importance yeah and so we put our intelligence as the bar of intelligence or the way that we can use them so we want cute cuddly things so we will favor cute cuddly animals we want to acknowledge that we are intelligent so we will favor similarly intelligent beings which is so arbitrary and arrogant, actually. Yeah, it is arrogant. Um, so another blog post that I found on the Vegan Feminist Network, which we'll also link in, link to in the show notes, uh, spoke about how the abolition of favored animals is valued, whereas for unfavored animals, so like your farm animals and things like that, are generally fought for in terms of regulation. So... Favorite animals being like dogs and cats, so we don't want to use and exploit them. But farm animals will just make them feel a bit better. And then the most marginalized we generally ignore. So rats are generally seen as vermin or pests. So we just exploit them in lab tests and things like that without even questioning. So in the blog post, they mention how we, quote, rely on human-created hierarchy of worth that privileges some species over others in presuming that a focus on those animals who are already specially favored is the best bet to eliminate some forms of speciesism altogether. So basically we create our own hierarchies and we presume that it's kind of cutting at the low branches of exploitation, looking at the animals that we favor the most and tackling those forms of exploitation as like a good bet to liberating animals. I suppose it, it makes logical sense in some ways, but it's still... It's not attacking the root, though. Yeah. Like and you it's, said, it's cu- they're cutting the low-hanging branches. Yeah, and then they're throwing all the other animals under the bus. Yeah, I've, there's also just... That's just not urgent enough, to be honest. Mm. So going back to your point about the random hierarchies of animals, I feel like there are some animals that kind of slip in, the, in and out between who we consider protecting or not protecting or in what ways... So, for example, horses. First of all, as a vegan, you should not be horse riding. I think we can safely say that. Definitely, yes. It's it's exploiting them. But I'm thinking about the fact that, you know, in France, there was that whole scandal of like, oh, they eat horses. That's so despicable. Yeah. You know, because we think of horses as this really regal, beautiful animal. And I think it's very easy to to kind of love them or the idea of them. But then at the same time, ride them or use them to do like polo with or horse racing. And if they break their leg, oh, well, you have to shoot them. them, But it's unacceptable to eat their flesh. So they're like worth protecting to a degree. You can exploit them to a degree. Mm. Eating them is not okay. And there's just these random lines of this is okay, this is not okay. And I'm sure that there are a lot of animals that fall into in between these gaps. Of- well, it's similar to as well how people say they love elephants, but they'll go watch them in a circus. Or if they get to the point where they're like, animals should not be in circuses, they'll still go on holiday somewhere and participate in elephant rides. Yeah, so inconsistent. Yeah. So I think it's quite obvious that 
single issue campaigns are just inherently and essentially speciesist. Mm. They just reinforce the idea that some animals are worth more than others. Cool. So the fifth abolitionist approach principle says abolitionists reject all forms of human discrimination, including racism, sexism, heterosexism, ageism, ableism, and classism, just as they reject speciesism. So it makes me think about racism within the idea of rejecting speciesism. For example, the Yulin Dog Meat Festival. Yeah. People are like up in arms about that and Mm -hmm. you'll struggle to find anyone who's not against that. And it's so morally inconsistent and I think has so much underlying racism. Mm. Why would you freak out about people killing animals when you're killing animals? Yeah, it's it's like got a got a double layer because Mm -hmm. you're concentrating on this other country and what they're doing when when the country that we live in is doing really atrocious things. Mm. And then also dogs and you being speciesist because... Why are dogs more important than any other animal? Yeah, it's the same as how um, a lot of people criticize Japan for their whaling, whereas Norway and Iceland are doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. And you don't really hear about that. You yeah, know? So let's attack the Eastern thing yeah. and ignore the European countries. Which is doing, doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. yeah. It's, and that is also has racism in it. Mm. So you cannot be abolitionist about... Uh, veganism and be racist yeah like it's so it's totally inconsistent and it also goes in south africa especially for things like ritual slaughters oh uh, yeah where granted there is a lot of cruelty and suffering involved uh, there's no regulation and there's like those backyard slaughters can be really really horrific for the animals but at the end of the day they're dying so are the animals at the abattoirs and the people who are criticizing those slaughters which happen much less frequently than the rate of killing in, in abattoirs. Um, but those are generally middle-class white people criticizing people of color who have like ritual slaughters for whatever reason once a year or however often it is for, yes, a brutal slaughter a lot of the time. But it's no different. Yeah, the slaughter in a, in a slaughterhouse is also brutal. Yeah, I think it's just out of sight, out of mind. And they can't deal with the idea of doing it themselves. Yeah. You know, at least the people doing the ritual slaughter are more consistent. Yeah, they're doing it themselves. So not yeah, that it's not, not that it's condoning yeah, there's at no, all. There's like, no excuse. Yeah, let's just be clear, we're not condoning any kind of slaughter, but also you get some problematic organizations, like for example, Peter, who who use like sexism or fat shaming mm. or body shaming, you know, or subtly racist things. Yeah. And I feel like that's so kind of productive to trying to achieve animal liberation, especially yeah. if you look at it from the abolitionist approach and within total liberation as well. Like we're never going to achieve anything while being inconsistent. You can't mm. be racist and vegan. Yeah, you can't fight against one form of oppression while you're participating in another. So I think it's, that's a really important abolitionist point to make. Mm. Um, So a quote from that same Vegan Feminist Network blog that I mentioned earlier, they say single issue campaigns are promoted by the movement because of their fundraising capacity, not their liberatory potential. And I think that is such an important point. So true. Because a lot of the single issue campaigns, aside from the inherently speciesist nature of them, is honestly just fundraising capacity. Like welfarist organizations can raise money for cute cuddly dogs so a lot of the organizations that promote single issue campaigns i think do so partially on purpose in that they don't want to push animal liberation and veganism because they will lose funding yeah that makes so much sense most funders are not going to be vegan organizations so it's easier to push the furry dog campaign than to say let's stop using animals Wow. and i think that in itself is just wrong on so many levels. It's then also appealing to big funders and big organizations that have money and are often ignoring underprivileged communities and their oppression. And the the people who have the most say about which animals get protected are the people who have money. Yeah. That also ties in with what we said earlier about like the fact that you can't just base your advocacy on what vegan cheese is available. Yeah. Liberation can't be based on consumer choices. The majority of people are poor. Mm. 
Mm. And so they also need to be taken into consideration and we need to remember this in our advocacy. Yeah, and even if you look at a lot of like vegan events and vegan fests and things like that, they're generally inaccessible to poor people. Yeah. There's a high cost attached to them and it's just, it's classist and it's yeah. privileged advocacy. The same thing with um, like why are you, why would you put all your energy into fighting against fur when the majority mm. of people can't even afford fur in the first place? Yeah. Same thing with trophy hunting. Like these single issues are like extremely privileged single issues mm. to be targeting. Why not be putting our energy into where the most people are, mm. which is underprivileged? Yeah, and I get that a lot of organizations think of it, like I mentioned earlier about the low-hanging branches. You know, they're kind of thinking, well, the majority of people can already acknowledge that fur is wrong. So let's just convince the rest and then maybe we can change legislation and then all of those animals that would have been used for fur will be helped. So, you know, when you say it like that, it sounds logical. It sounds like it makes sense. Same with trophy hunting. You can argue that it's unnecessary and you can argue that it's sport. So it's very unnecessary. But again, it's all unnecessary. Yeah. Even if we abolish the use of fur and the use of trophy hunting, for example, in the short term, that small group of animals will benefit. And that might seem like a worthwhile goal, but those same people will keep exposing animals in different ways throughout the day, every single day, as if nothing is wrong. And they'll actually feel better because now they're, they're animal lovers. They don't wear fur. Full stop. Whereas if you just take the time to educate about veganism, maybe you have a tenth of the amount of people going vegan, but they will then stop all of that exploitation at once. Yeah. Which arguably saves a lot more animals in in the long and short term. Yeah, exactly. So we can't be classist in our approach of who we target. Yeah. If you're just targeting fur wearers and trophy hunters, mm. you're targeting like a very small group of people yeah. who are privileged, you know, exactly. not the majority. Talking about privilege, what do you think about um, documentaries that you have to pay for or you have to have access to Netflix to be able to watch? I think that if a documentary focuses on animal liberation or any kind of liberation, it should be free. Yeah, I because, agree. Well, I think all education should be free, which obviously is not the case, <laughs> but, but it should be. If you have the means to create a documentary, which is what I really like about the fact that you can like stream Earthlings for free now, Land of Hope and Glory has always been free to stream. I mean, it's cool to get documentaries on platforms like Netflix because it means that it might reach more people by accident rather than them having to search it. But I don't know how those kind of networks work, if there's like rights restrictions, but it would be cool if it was maybe there for a few months and then freely available. Yeah. Um, I think the key is to get as many people as possible without being classist and, you know, only targeting people who have Netflix. Yeah, because I mean, I think the majority of people have access to internet. But yeah. The majority of people can't afford to purchase a documentary online yeah. or to have a Netflix account. Yeah, exactly. I feel like if you have information that can make the world a better place, you almost have an, an obligation to share it for free. Yeah. To reach as many people as possible. And that's not to say that there's anything wrong with making a living or that you should be able to eat as well. If you've put three solid months of your life into editing a documentary, and you have no other form of income, sure, you have to work out a way to make income from that. But there are maybe other ways to fundraise beforehand or during. Um, yeah, I mean, th that should be based on what your motivation was. Yeah. Like, so I think that's an important thing to think about as well. Real men. I fucking oh. hate <laughs> it when people <clears throat> use real men do this or real mm -hmm. men don't do this. Please stop. Seriously. And a lot of animal rights organizations think that they are breaking down gender stereotypes by saying things like, real men eat plants. No, bro. You're still saying real men should be a certain way. That's sexist. Yeah, exactly. Like, so you, I get that while you might be trying to break stereotypes of what a man is, you are replacing it with another stereotype and still perpetuating gender roles. Yeah, and granted, it's better to have a good stereotype than a bad one. Like, oh, real men eat plants. That's nice. But but it doesn't matter. Any man or like, person or how, however you identify is yeah. a human being. Yeah, 
If you are a man, you are a real man. Yeah. Regardless, your sexual orientation, the things you do, whatever, you are still a real man or human. There's no ideal. You can be a shit person or a great person, and regardless of your sexual gender, you, you are that thing. You can still be a real man. Yes. Like, real men do eat plants, and real men do eat animal flesh. One is just a garbage man, <laughs> but you're both real yeah. men. I mean, I saw a great meme the other day that said it had this guy crossing, crossing out the sign that said, mm. real men eat meat, mm. and said, ethical humans eat plants and don't perpetuate gender stereotypes. Yes, exactly. That just sums it up perfectly. So please stop mm. using... I mean, the intention is good, sure. And you're breaking down like that whole real men should be aggressive and muscular. But yeah, just stop with the real anyone should do anything you're not really breaking down much because you're still using yeah you still you're still perpetuating the idea that a certain gender should behave in a certain way to be socially acceptable yeah exactly and you should be socially acceptable as a human being no matter what yeah but your actions are not acceptable yeah in certain situations and that has nothing to do with your gender yeah. or any other aspect of you as a human exactly so I think as well as this, within um, animal liberation and veganism, body shaming and, di and disease shaming are two problems as well yeah. that you should think about. When we're talking about rejecting all forms of human discrimination, if you're telling someone, are oh, you going to look like a supermodel if you go vegan? That's a lie. Of course if it's If you're lie. telling someone you're not going to get a disease because you're going vegan, also. Mm. Like, there's no ideal. If you want to look a certain way, if you want to be an athlete, if you want to be not an athlete and just be a regular looking person, that's your prerogative. Yeah. Like, as long as you are vegan, it doesn't matter. Mm. And that's not to say that you always have a choice in how you look and your body shape exactly. and all that. But I think it's also, on the one hand, it's important to know facts and details that can help in vegan advocacy, like the research that has been shown to reduce risks of disease and reduce body fat percentage and things like that but it's not a clear cut and dry this is going to happen yeah you can't promise someone if you go vegan you aren't going to get a disease because then yeah. when they do get a disease or if they do they're going to feel like shit because mm. you told them this and they, yeah. they believe this like oh i'm invincible now but there's many other factors than your diet mm. and this again comes back to advocating whether it's for consumer choices or whatever it is but advocating in a way that reinforces that your veganism should be about you exactly. like it's not about you it's not about your convenience it's not about you wanting to look better or whatever it's about ethics and exactly. it's about animals and and basically i think you would agree with me when we say there's no way that we're ever going to achieve total liberation or even animal liberation while we are tolerant of any other forms of oppression in our yeah. movement Definitely. So the final principle, the sixth principle of the abolitionist approach says abolitionists recognize the principle of nonviolence as a core principle of the animal rights movement. So this is one principle that I disagree a bit with Francie Yon on. I don't think that violence can be inflicted on an inanimate, inanimate object. I think it's ridiculous to call destruction of property violence, especially when it's in defense of victims of actual violence. Yeah. Obviously, the intention is important. For mm -hmm. example, um, in a domestic setting, if someone's like throwing something mm -hmm. and it breaks to intimidate someone else, that's violence. Yeah. But if someone is damaging property and making sure that no human or non-human animal is around, to inflict economic damage with the intention of preventing future violence then I think that is not violence. It's defense of victims. For example, I wouldn't see violence in destroying a vivisection laboratory because you are stopping really horrendous future violence from happening. Yeah. And that's why a lot of people support um, movements like the ALF, Animal Liberation Front, because they support the destruction of property when it's property belonging to people who exploit animals. As long as no human or non-human animals are harmed in the process. So I was listening to a podcast the other day on Animal Rights Zone where they interviewed Steve Best and he described really well why actions like ALF 
um, type actions are not violent and why they're necessary. And he mentioned, quote, we are just now talking about education and legislation. We've forgotten all about agitation. And I think wow, that's, that's, awesome. that's really relevant because we have to agitate a system of oppression to get it to change um, in addition to legislation changes and education. And then he goes on to say they're not violence, they're simply necessary. And they're necessary when they're necessary and intelligent people will know. Yeah, Uncle Steve. I think that's that sums it up brilliantly. Um, we, we're definitely for the idea that as far as possible, we should be nonviolent in our advocacy. But there's going to come a time where there has to be some level of violence in order to liberate animals. While we do agree that if you can do it in a nonviolent way, do that. Mm. But I personally feel like things currently are too urgent yeah. in this movement. Yeah, I mean, how long do we have to spend playing nice before we force people to listen? Yeah. And I'm not saying go and slap burgers out of people's hands and just get aggressive unnecessarily but at some point there's going to have to be some kind of at least agitating behavior that people have no choice but to listen yeah it's it's just like it's simply too urgent mm. in, in my opinion we are in the the sixth mass extinction of life on earth so there have been five natural ones before this this one is driven by us Animal agriculture is destroying the planet. Watch Cowspiracy if you haven't seen it yet. We are currently killing roughly 70 billion land animals. That's excluding ocean animals, which is far more. And are feeding the majority of crops to animals grown for food, mm. which could be fed to people. And frankly, things are fucked. Yeah, totally. The animals and the earth do not have time for us to promote anything less than veganism, animal liberation, and total liberation. And in a clear and direct way. Yeah. And if you think about it, if there was some other violence going on, because animal agriculture is violence, you know, it's one thing to say, let's not be violent in our advocacy, but we're fighting violence. Yeah. So if you can imagine your neighbors, for example, abusing kids next door, maybe they have like a sweatshop next door or something. Yeah, sure, you can phone the cops or you can do whatever. But when, it, when that is legal, what's your, your nonviolent option? To go and ask them to, to not exploit children? And yes, you can have an educational talk with them. And then what if they still say no? What if they laugh in your face? There's going to be a point where you're going to smash into that house with a baseball bat and free those kids. Yeah. Because justice sometimes needs violence. And nobody would question me. Everybody would probably pat me on the back for that. But when it comes to animals, everyone's like, hey, you know, yeah. no, let's, you can't, not, let's not be violent. You can't smash a door with a baseball bat. That's super violent. <laughs> you know, yeah. Even if you are liberating a child that's being beaten, you know? Yeah. And you also just need to realize that the people that, who we are fighting against, they are almost never going to be open to dialogue. Mm. You can't see someone attacking someone else and saying, hey, can you just come down? Let's chat about this. Yeah, you're going to jump in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yes, be nonviolent when you can, but sometimes we're going to have to. Just totally. saying. Just saying. <laughs> we're not condoning violence. <laughs> Disclaimer. Kind of. But also we are. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the six main, well, the six primary principles of abolition. Um but just a couple of other points that we had. One main criticism I've seen of the abolitionist approach is that if you're only focusing on all animals all the time and veganism all the time, then there could be a tendency towards people doing nothing because they can't tackle everything at once. And my response to that is that's not what abolitionists are saying. They're not saying do nothing. They're not saying that if there's a chance to help you know, an animal right in front of you, that you shouldn't do that. But then that when you are advocating for a specific animal or in a specific setting, that you just maintain a clear vegan message. That's all. It's not saying that you have to do everything at once or nothing at all. Mm, good point. One, one point that I wanted to bring up was that I think that real change is going to come from a grassroots movement. Mm. So it needs to come from the bottom up. And the problem with single issue campaigns and organizations is that they often end up in the hands of like big, like wealthy charities or leaders. And 
I just think that that is not what we can rely on. We can't rely on funding or leadership or like policies to create change. We have to start from a grassroots point of view mm. and take it from there. And that's, I think, the only way we're going to have any form of effective worldwide movement. Yeah. And as we said earlier, you know, those big organizations that have the funding are the ones who are going to promote non-vegan campaigns because that's how they maintain funding. And things like policy change take a really long time. Legislation t change takes a long time. So it does have to be bottom up. And I think we also need to realize that because uh, a lot of those welfare and other kind of wealthy organizations do get all this funding, they essentially have a whole lot of resources funneled there, which is helping a specific breed or a specific type of animal, which is essentially taking away resources from potential vegan advocacy, you know, and vegan education. And instead of creating this like general understanding of anti-speciesism, we are just funneling money into perpetuating speciesism. Yeah. Which totally. doesn't make sense. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. But I think that they can get funding easily because like I personally think that most people are more open to single issue campaigns and organizations because they are just easier to digest, excuse the pun. Mm. Basically, you can pick and choose the areas of exploitation that threaten your lifestyle the least. Mm. So for example, someone could be against canned lion hunting, but then still eat animal flesh and secretions. So supporting an industry that destroys the habitats of and kills the very animals they're trying to fight for in the first place. Exactly. So. But I think there again, that's where the the error comes in in thinking that that's a good thing to to say well these people are never going to stop eating animal flesh so let's just get them to be anti-hunting because that makes them feel like they're doing something for animals and it's not it's just reinforcing every other form of exploitation yeah. that they're engaged in every single day and i think a lot of the the issue with these single issue campaigns as well is that there's this kind of perception of people as being incapable of change and incapable of critical thought and introspection which let's be honest most most people don't want to engage in but we also have to give them that opportunity we can't just tackle these so-called easy single issues to the so-called animal lovers that just want to help dogs and cats or wildlife or whatever we need to give them the chance give them the education give them the information and let them make sense of it themselves because veganism is not a difficult concept to grasp the fact that we shouldn't be exploiting another living being human or non-human is not a difficult thing to understand and most people especially if they consider themselves animal lovers even if they're just actually pet lovers or wildlife lovers or whatever they can understand why speciesism is wrong if they just get the right information and i think we're undermining people's intelligence and potential for change by taking these easy these easy shortcuts to helping some animals. Yeah, totally agree. So I think we can conclude that single issue organizations and campaigns and activism are problematic. And to those listening, I would like to ask you to join us in this fight for animal liberation, for total liberation, by going vegan, by fighting speciesism, and by getting active. Mm. I totally agree with that sentiment. And I just want to add as well that one critique that I have of people like Francione is that they often slate um, a lot of other organizations, which I think is important. It's important to call out problematic organizations and problematic campaigns. But I also just want to emphasize that that's not what we're trying to do here. We're not trying to put all our emphasis into telling people the wrong way and the right way to do activism because we're not perfect by any means we're not experts we're just trying to analyze uh, our own activism and the activism we see happening around us to be the most effective for the animals so we don't think that single issue campaigns are an effective form of activism but i personally would rather see people being active than non-active even if i don't fully agree with the way that you're advocating i still support that you're trying to do something i think all we're trying to ask is that people think about the activism they're doing, think about the language they're using, um, think about the messages they're sending and what those connotations that are attached to that kind of activism are essentially doing for animals in the long run. 
So just be critical of your own activism, critical of the way you do things, and we'll continue to do the same about ours. We'd love to hear your thoughts on the issue and your thoughts on what we had to say. If you disagree with us, if you agree with us, it's all good. Let us know. Yeah, drop us an email on let's rage together podcast at gmail.com um, or send us a message on Instagram or Facebook. Mm-hmm. And again, send us dog photos or cat photos or pig photos or cow photos or any animal photos that you have because we love all animals equally. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Love and liberation. I've done nothing wrong. So free me. I just want to feel what life should be. I just want enough space to turn around and face the truth. So free